Hey everybody, this is Aaron from Aaron's Audio Corner, and I want to talk about the perfect loudspeaker. Is there one? Simple answer is no. There is not a perfect loudspeaker, and that is for a multitude of reasons. Now, the reason I want to discuss this topic is because you all know that I provide measurements, and the goal is not necessarily to find a perfect quote-unquote loudspeaker, but a maybe a perfect loudspeaker for you with uh, your budget, you're willing to accept trade-offs as far as size, budget, output capabilities, um, aesthetics, you know, just a multitude of different things that go into a speaker purchase decision. Because while I certainly believe that measurements are an absolute great factor into buying the right speaker for you, it's not always the end all. And I am the first one to certainly accept that. And I think that the majority of people in the audio community, uh, those reviewers who are like me would be willing to admit that as much. And if you are not willing to admit that, then I think that you're probably kidding yourself because not everybody has the same budgets. Not everybody has the same goals. And while the research from Dr. Floyd tools book, hang on. Oh, from this book does indicate that the majority of people when uh, given a blind test, so a speaker that they had no idea what was playing, uh, they preferred for the most part, a more neutral speaker, one that doesn't add or take away anything from the original recording that you're listening to. And it turns out that you don't have to be a trained listener and you don't have to be an audiophile. You can be a newbie off the street, the majority of people prefer that same kind of sound. Now, how we get to that sound can be any number of ways. And the problem with loudspeakers is that you're never going to get that perfect sound, at least in my opinion. And one reason, obviously, is cost. Um, so let's start with something that most people in audio are familiar with. And if you aren't, this is your introduction to Hoffman's Iron Law. And this is simply saying that there are three things that you choose between and you get two of them. The three that you can choose between are size, efficiency, and low frequency extension. And what does that mean? Well, simply put, that just means that if you want all three of those you're not going to get all three of those. You're going to have to choose. You may be able to get low frequency extension and efficiency, but in order to do that, you're going to have to have a large enclosure, a large subwoofer or a large floor standing speaker, something like that. I mean, something that's pretty dang big. Alternatively, if you want a small enclosure, but you want low frequency extension, so you want bass that reaches down low, then you're going to have to give up efficiency. It just means that you're going to need a speaker that has a low sensitivity, it's going to need a lot more amplifier power, and most likely you're going to wind up running into compression issues. That's the Hoffman's Iron Law up front, and that's the one that most everybody's familiar with. But I want to take this a step further. I want to go outside of the, the standard, you know, everybody understands the Hoffman's Iron Law trade-off. And let's, let's talk about other things that really delve into the topic of, you know, preference versus reference. And the one easy thing for me to talk to you about is soundstage radiation. And so let's talk about the soundstage width. There are speakers that have more narrow radiation patterns, and there are speakers that have more wide radiation patterns, which, which just means that, you know, if you're standing in front of the speaker and as you start traversing to the side of it, traversing? I don't know. Maybe that's the right word. As you start going to the side of the speaker, the sound, you know, the intensity falls off, but maybe not a lot. Whereas with other speakers, as soon as you get to about 30 degrees to the side, you're missing a whole lot of high frequency content. So the former would be a wide, uh, wide radiating speaker, and the latter would be a more narrow radiating speaker. And what does that mean to you? Well, for one thing, that has to do with room interaction. The wider one will typically, at least in my experience, have a more wide soundstage because it's reflecting off the walls. It's giving more ambience to the sound. Um, and then that reflection acts as another point source on either side of the, of the speaker. But the more narrow radiation one will just 
you know, it, it won't have the soundstage width, but more than likely it's going to have more focus because there's less uh, maybe diffusion going on at the side of the speaker. So less interaction with the room, a more precise soundstage. And that actually holds true for home audio and car audio. And in my experience with car audio, that's the one main benefit of a wideband speaker and not using a tweeter. But the problem with that is as soon as you shift your head just a little bit to the side, that sound stage starts to collapse and fall apart. You've really got a very, very tight, uh, narrow sweet spot for a speaker with a very narrow radiation pattern. Whereas a speaker with a wide radiation pattern, you've got more ability to kind of move to the side. And I'm not talking about going sit in a seat next to you, but I'm talking about, you know, if you shift your head or, you know, you're just trying to get comfortable, you don't have to have that quote head in a vice uh, phenomenon going on. To help you understand what I mean here, I'm going to give you a couple graphics from some recent speakers that I've tested. One is going to be the ELAC UBR62, and the other is the KEF R3. Now, these are both bookshelf speakers, and these are both coincident, coaxial design speakers, and they are roughly the same size. So for the most part, they are directly comparable. What we have here is the ELAC UBR62. This is the horizontal radiation pattern. And really what we're paying attention to is in the red. That's where the meat of the sound is going to be. And then as you start going to the side of the red, then you start having less energy. Now, right down here, this zero mark, that is looking directly at the speaker. So if it were sitting in front of you like this, now we're gonna move to the side and 180 degrees is gonna be behind the speaker back here, okay? So with that said, you can see that this speaker's radiation pattern is about plus or minus 60 degrees. So 60 degrees to either side uh, until about eight kilohertz where it starts to narrow up. What this really means then is that this speaker has a very wide radiation pattern, at least through the mid range. And then as it gets to the high frequency, it starts to roll off. Now that's a different topic. We'll maybe try to come back to in this video, but if not, maybe just keep that in mind. The KEF R3, as you can see, is a more narrow radiation pattern. And the widest it gets is about six degrees, but that's up to about maybe one kilohertz. And then going above that, it trends out to, let's see, at eight kilohertz, it's down to about 45 degrees. And yeah, if you just kind of compare these back to back, you can clearly see that the ELAC is much wider in the mid-range. And personally speaking, now this is all preference, I generally prefer a wider, radiation pattern speaker because I like the room interaction. I like the sidewall bounce that gives you that sense of uh, soundstage width. But having said that, you can see that from the mid-range to the tweeter area, the KEF R3 is much more uniform. So that means it's narrowing in radiation, but it's doing so pretty constantly. You know, you can basically draw a straight line. Whereas the ELAC narrows up really quickly above eight kilohertz. So it starts to beam right at about eight kilohertz. This is a prime example of where somebody who may not understand the measurements may simply say, hey, both of them measured similarly, uh, but I definitely prefer this one over this one. Now, why is that? Well, that's when you start getting into preference. And then that also is where you start getting into trade-offs because the ELAX on axis frequency response is... Uh, not quite linear. I mean, you can see there's a dip in the low to maybe upper mid bass region. Uh, there's a peaking going on around the seven, five, 700 Hertz region. Uh, there's a little bit more peaking going on around this four to six kilohertz region and a dip. Now, some of these peaks and dips are pretty standard for a coaxial coincident drive unit. But when you look at the KEF, you can see that the on axis response is really, um, much better, at least in terms of its linearity. And it does have a bump of about two to three dB on axis in the treble region, but the contour is much more linear. Whereas with the ELAC, you had some pretty significant dips um, on axis. So if you're looking at this graphic only, odds are you're probably gonna say, well, the KEF is the better speaker. And I would certainly agree that objectively based, the KEF is the better speaker. However, there's another set of measurements called the estimated in-room response, which will help you identify uh, what the speaker is going to sound like in your room. So let's look at that example. 
Here we have the ELAC UBR62. And what we can see is if we try to draw a straight line through here, we see that, you know, it actually looks pretty good. There's a nice downward slope to the frequency response going this way. Um, but we still do have some kind of peaks and dips going on here. But more than likely, and in my experience, what I found with this particular speaker when I was listening was that I actually enjoyed the overall tonality of the speaker. Now, if we look at the KEF R3, what we see is even though the predicted in-room response has less variation in it, you can clearly see that there is a treble bump. And some people may like that. Some people may not like that. Uh, there are things about the KEF R3 that I definitely liked more than I liked about the ELAC UBR62. But the one thing that I really liked about the, the ELAC was that it just had a wider soundstage and it didn't sound uh, treble heavy at all. Whereas with the KEF, you know, it had a more narrow soundstage pattern and the top end sounded just a little bit boosted. And I, and I can see why I thought this sounded that way by looking at this graphic. And that's one reason why measurements can certainly tell you a whole lot, but you've also got to understand A, how to read the graphic and B, how it relates to what you like. Uh, this single graphic does a great job of telling you what you'll, uh, what you'll most likely hear in your room, but this single graphic doesn't tell you what the radiation pattern is. That's why you need the other data, so the off-axis data that I provide as well. And then you can piece those together and start telling the story of, this is more likely to be the speaker that I like uh, than this one. And you can also just purchase a couple of them and say, all right, well, I, I like this aspect of it, and then I'm able to correlate it with this measurement. And that makes you a better uh, purchase maker. And, and ideally, you don't have to go through and buy like 10 to 20 different speakers to try out. You can just narrow it down quickly to a, to a handful and get there a lot more efficiently and saving you time and money as well. That's an example of speaker to speaker comparison. But then you've got all these other aspects, like neither one of those speakers can get crazy loud because they're bookshelf speakers. They incorporate a single six and a half inch midwoofer. And even though they're ported, they just don't have real low uh, frequency extension. So what do you do about that? Well, typically you've got to go larger, uh, maybe an eight inch midwoofer. And if you don't want to go with that route, you go multiple woofers. And then when you go multiple woofers, that's when you start incorporating more and more challenges, more complexities. Uh, what do I mean by that? Well, the more speakers that you have, the harder it is to provide a, a constant radiation pattern. And what I mean by that is, think back to the KEF example that we just looked at where the, the radiation was just kind of constant throughout. You know, it started kind of wide and then it narrowed up as you went in frequency versus the ELAC where it, it was very, very wide. And then at the top, it just chopped off. You know, it just became very, very focused. Um, that is not quite ideal. And there are speakers that I've tested. For instance, this clips back here, um, it has some really wonky stuff going on in the directivity pattern. So as it goes from the mid woofer to the mid range, it narrows up at one spot and then gets wide again. And then when it goes from the mid range to the tweeter, it narrows up and gets wide again. Why does that matter? Well, let's, let's imagine that you're listening to an instrument that has its fundamental note at one kilohertz and the frequency response is wide off axis. So you it's, it's really good off axis, but when it hands over to the tweeter, there's a very big issue there in the directivity pattern and it narrows up all of a sudden. And let's say that the, the marriage of those two is around two kilohertz. So an octave up. So that harmonic that you're hearing from the, the one kilohertz now, all of a sudden, it goes from being wide to very narrow. And what happens with your soundstage? Well, that means your soundstage isn't constantly wide. So you may have that instrument at this position at one frequency, but its harmonic is over here. And that's a problem. Some people may like that. I can't tell you that I've run into anybody that says they want a soundstage that is jumping around. Uh, I can imagine for the most part, maybe I'm overgeneralizing, that everybody would want the instrument to sound like it's coming from one place rather than multiple places other than something like the Bose 901, where they intentionally do some diffusion uh, with the speaker to make it sound broad. But the focus of the images in the soundstage is just non-existent, basically. So that's one trade-off that you're going to have to deal with when you're talking about going from you know, you know, one driver to another and when you're implementing multiples. Uh, good speakers can do that well. They can implement the crossover network very, very well, and that handoff is smooth but that's going to cost money because components cost money. 
good drive units cost money. Resistors, capacitors, inductors, all the pieces that you need for a passive filter cost money. And then you talk about passive to active speakers. So speakers that have their own DSP built in with their own DSP crossover and equalization built in to get you a good speaker on and off axis. Well, that's more money too. Now, certainly there's a breaking point where it's probably cheaper to have a DSP built in than it is to have a fourth order crossover passive component built into the cabinet. But then there's the other aspect too, of some people really like to roll their own. They like to buy their own amplifiers for one reason or another. Maybe they think their amplifiers have a signature. Um, maybe their amplifiers actually do have a signature where they're rolled off or there's something going on, which in my opinion is not an ideal amplifier, but nonetheless, some people like what they like. So there's that aspect too of, you know, do you want active or do you want passive? And then there's that cost aspect. And then we're back to, you know, where are you going to put this thing? If it's an active speaker, you're going to have to have RCA inputs or XLR inputs. Does your system have that capability? You know, do you have a DAC that has those outputs? You may, you may not. Uh, you may just have an integrated receiver in your home theater or your living room where it's just got speaker output banana plugs, and then you just run it to your speaker and you're done. Another example, and I've thrown this one out there a few times, uh, Macintosh amplifiers. I love those suckers. I mean, I can't, I know why. I just, I think they're gorgeous. Uh, for me, there's a bit of nostalgia there. And I can tell you right now, if somebody said, hey, I will give you either one of these amplifiers for free, you pick. They could say, I'm going to give you the best measuring amplifier, the the flattest frequency response, which both of them are going to have to have flat frequency response. But one has maybe a little bit more noise than the other one does, uh, neither of which you can hear. And there's some other things in the specs that indicate maybe this speak or this amplifier is the better one versus this Macintosh. Which one am I going to pick? Macintosh. Why? Uh, because I like them. I just think they're awesome. And there's a product of ownership level there. And that goes into loudspeakers. That's every single component you buy. And I think as long as you're just honest with yourself and, you know, as a reviewer, as long as I'm honest with you guys about what my expectations are, we're all the better for it. You know, like, man, I don't care if you like X, Y, or Z speaker. My, my role here as a reviewer is to simply inform you of what the speaker is doing. Uh, I'm not going to knock you if you want to buy this clips. I think it sounds like hot garbage. I'm just being honest, but some people love it. And if you love it, man, kudos to you. View my data as a, as a tool in your toolbox to understand what it is you like about it. Maybe it's the high sensitivity because it has like 94 dB or 96 dB, somewhere around there, uh, sensitivity. And that's really, really high. Now, what is the trade-off? It's got a 12 inch midwoofer. Do you think it gets low? Remember, High sensitivity, low frequency, and size are the three from Hoffman's Iron Law you get to choose from. Well, it's pretty big. It's got high sensitivity. That means your low frequency extension is going to go away. And it does roll off, I think, around 70 or 80 hertz. That's a 12-inch midwoofer, 70 or 80 hertz. I've got a pair of, well, not a pair. I've got LCR 15-inch Pro Audio JBL midwoofers upstairs in my home theater. Uh I built the cabinets for them and the port tuning is somewhere in the 50 Hertz region. So below that, man, they're non-existent. Definitely going to have to run a subwoofer for, for those and for the ones I use in my home theater. Again, trade-offs. But my point with all this, again, just to hammer home is that, you know, when I do a review, if I'm hard on a product and you own it, I'm not knocking you. Uh, maybe I'm just hard on the product because I'm, I'm upset with the manufacturer. I think they could have done better or... In most cases, it's when a manufacturer makes claims that just simply are not true. Uh, I've done some speaker tests where a manufacturer has claimed, you know, studio quality sound out of a budget monitor that is anything but studio quality because a studio monitor should have flat on-axis response and smooth off-axis response. And if it doesn't, and you're telling me that it does, well, then, yeah, I'm going to be a little bit hard on that. But otherwise, you know, I'm just here to provide you the information and hopefully you will do with it what you will. And I don't want people to get trapped in the notion that it's got to have, you know, all these criteria in order to be a perfect speaker. Or if it's this thing, then it's perfect while ignoring the other aspects of the speaker. There's all these trade-offs. And with all these trade-offs comes understanding the data, understanding what it is that you like, and trying to couple those together to help you figure out, you know, what makes the most sense for you. So with that said, I'm out. I hope you all have a good one. Take care. Peace.